more evident now than ever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, right now. As we come to this word today, we ask you, Father God, teach the way that you want to teach. And let your words be manifest inside of our lives. Lord, we give you honor and we give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're just going to go slow with this and let God do what God wants to do. Uh, amen. And see where God wants to go with this. But it's important that we need to establish inside of our hearts and minds whether we believe that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. It's one who is holy, one who is wise, and one who is mighty, yet wonderfully tender, sensitive, and compassionate. We've got to set this inside of our minds. Hey, man, do we believe that he is one who is worthy to receive our reverence, affection, and, and faith, love, devotion, and complete surrender? Or do we instead believe that the Holy Spirit is simply an influence proceeding from God, some sort of divine mystical power that only shows up when we need for him to show up to empower me to do something? But if we see him as infinite in majesty, glory, splendor, wisdom, knowledge, and holiness, and if we believe that he is, a, as a person, as a accord with the Father and Son to take possession of our lives and make good out of them, then we will fall on our face in awe of him. But listen to this. But someone who sees God's Spirit as an influence or supreme power will constantly say, I want more of the Spirit. I want more of the Spirit. But however, when someone sees him as a wonderful person, we say this, how can I give myself more to him? Amen. So in order for us to be able to do this, we've got to understand him a little bit more than what we do. Amen. And that's what we're going to look at. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, verse 54 through 58. When you get there, say amen. Glory to God. And as my brother Jacob would say, we're going to divide this in three sections this morning. Amen. For your glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. For God's glory. I always do that. I just don't tell you what I'm doing. Amen. But the first thing we got to understand is this right here, that the Spirit of God will not manifest where He is not wanted. The Spirit of God will not manifest where He is not honored. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 54 through 58, we have this, this, this reading of the Word of God. It says, When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works from? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brother James, uh, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, our prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. At this point in time, Jesus had been baptized in the Jordan, and we have the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove. Now, notice this. It wasn't a dove. It was like a dove. Something that happened and something that John seen come down from heaven. But until this point, Jesus didn't do any miracles. He had no miracle signs and wonders. He had nothing at all going on. But the moment that he received this and the Spirit of God descended on upon him, now he began to do miracles. He began to do signs. He began to do wonders. Amen. But understand this, that where there is no honor, there can be no glory. Where there is no honor, there can be no glory. They didn't honor him for who he was, so he could only do little things there and heal a couple of people. Amen. You know, in our churches today, that if we see a healing take place, we get all jumped up and take off running around the church in some places. Amen. But it said this, he couldn't do much there because they was not honoring him for who he was. They seen him as the carpenter's son. They seen him as Mary's son. They seen him as well, whose son? Joseph's son, right? They didn't see him as the son of God. They seen him as an ordinary person, so they did not honor him. So whether there is no honor in the house, there is not going to be any glory that's going to take place. You can have the best praise team. You can have the best worship team. You can have the sound. You can have the lights. You can have the smoke going through the air. No matter what you do, there's not going to be any manifestation of the Spirit of God because there's no glory there if you're not going to honor him and welcome him into the house of God. Many ministers today stand ministering in this pulpit, which I have done several times in my life, on their own accord to go out tired, weary, and drawn. Amen. So to come in the very presence of God, saying, Lord, we welcome you here in this house. We want you to come in this house. Now, there are some people that don't want that because when the Spirit of God manifests, He began to expose some things in the house of God. 
Amen. But we want God to manifest. We want the Spirit of God to manifest the living Word of God to expose some things not only in our life, but what He's doing in the world around us. Amen. Amen. Are you with me right now? Glory to God. Again, where there is no honor, there can be no glory. In John chapter 5, verse 19 through 23, go ahead and go there, please. John chapter 5, verse 19 through 23. This passage comes on the hill of Jesus healing the man at the pool of Bethsaida on the Sabbath day, and the Jews sought to kill him because they didn't, they, they didn't seek to kill, to kill him because he healed the man. They sought to kill him because he healed the man on the Sabbath which to them was defying the law. In John chapter 5, verse 19 through 23, this is Jesus' response to them. He said this, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Verse 20, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, Even so, the Son gives life to whom He will. Verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. And he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Without Jesus honoring the Father, He could not do what the Father did. So when He came, He was bringing honor to the Father which was in heaven. And in the reality, God began to manifest here upon the earth and bring the power of God here to manifest the glory of God. Amen. Are you with me this morning? The very things that Jesus did brought honor to the Father because he could only do what he's seen the Father do. So many times we've got ministers standing in the pulpit trying to do things they've not heard the Spirit of God say to do or see it in Scripture, but they're trying to make something up by saying, well, it's not in the Word of God, but God told me this. If it's not in the Word of God, how can we believe if it's not in the Word of God. Because the Spirit of God is truth. And the Spirit of God can only reveal what's written in the Word of God, which is the truth of the living Word of God. Amen. Glory to God. But John 14, 26, I mean, we're going to go over some basic stuff this morning. John 14, 26, we had this account. And Jesus tells His disciples, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all things that I said to you. Now listen to this. Honoring unites vision and purpose, which brings amazing results. Because everyone is not starting over. They're building on what God has already established. We don't need no new doctrines. We don't need no new books of the Bible. What we need is for the Spirit of God to speak and for us to listen and begin to rely upon Him for all truth. Amen. That's the manifestation that turns our reality into the reality of God. Amen. Glory to God. So the Holy Spirit is not human, but He's deity. He's deity. Amen. Humans were created in God's image, but listen to this. So He's not like us. We are like Him. So when we study the Scripture, you'll see that He is one that is most holy, and His desire is to be our closest friend. Amen. He's to be so close to us that wherever I walk, He walks. He used to be so close to us that wherever I go, he goes. Amen. So if I'm going into a place I shouldn't go, he's there with me. That's why conviction rises upon us because we're doing something we shouldn't be doing. And it's grieving him. Amen. Glory to God. Now understand this. If we get a hold of this, what God is going to unfold over the next several months, I promise you, you will not be taken by surprise when prophetic events begin to unfold before your eyes. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Glory to God. Well, the second thing we see is this right here, is that the Holy Spirit is not immune. He has a personality. He has a personality. Amen. Glory to God. Let's look at some of these. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 27. The Holy Spirit has a mind. Amen. Verse 27, Paul writes and says this. Now he searches the hearts. That he, now, now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes the intercession for the saints according to the will of God. What is the will of God? It's the written word of God. Amen. Jesus is the expression of the thoughts of God, the Father, speaking into the world, the very existence of the reality that God wants us to have. Amen. Glory to God. So it says this, that he searches the hearts. Amen. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to who? The will of God. 
He doesn't make it according to the very known doctrine taking place or the mainline teaching taking place right now. It says that he intercedes based upon our life according to the will of God. What's the will of God? It's the word of God. Look at your neighbor and say it's the word of God is the will of God. Amen. Glory to God. You know, people get so mad that when you take the word of God, you begin to stand on scripture. You write it out, put it up on your refrigerator. You put it up on your bathroom. You put it inside of your car. They get so mad and upset. They come to the point, they say, just tell me your, your opinion. <laughs> I want your opinion. No, you don't want my opinion. If you want my opinion, I'm fixing to beat you down with it. Amen. You want the word of God, which has grace and mercy. You don't want my opinion. You don't want my opinion because my flesh is now beginning to rise up and the spirit man's out the car right now. Amen. You don't want my opinion. You want the will of God. You want the grace of God. You want the mercy of God because the will of God is truth. And the truth can never be overcome by a lie. Amen. Are you with me right now? Glory to God. Well, we also see in Scripture that he has the will and he has emotions. Amen. I mean, if you look at, at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about these great charismatic gifts that's taking place inside the church body. And verse 11 says this, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So the Spirit of God has a will. And we have a will. And there's times inside of our life we don't do His will because we want to do our will. And when we do our will, we always get in trouble. But when we do His will, we always have the victory. Right. Amen. So it may not make any sense to you right now what He's telling you to do, what the Word tells you to do. It may not make sense now. Don't be concerned about that. Just do it, and then all of a sudden God will make sense about it later. Right. Amen. He'll make sense about it later. Are you still with me this morning? Amen. Glory to God. If you go over and you look in Romans chapter 15, 30, Romans chapter 15, 30, Paul begins to write this. He begins to talk about the Lord Jesus. He begins to talk about the Spirit of God. He begins to talk about God the Father, showing all three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, the God, all working together in one. And he says this, he says, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. So we see here that he's full of emotions, he's full of love, he can be grieved, but not only that, he can also bring comfort. He can also bring comfort, amen? Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 31. We're just laying a foundation here. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Paul is writing. He talks to the churches all throughout Judea, Gal Galilee, and Samaria. And he says this. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Now, why was the church multiplied? It's because they was walking in the fear of the Lord. They was all edified, but they also had peace. How did they have peace? They had the comfort of the Holy Spirit working among them. Amen. When you begin to submit yourself to the Spirit of God and begin to walk with Him and not against Him, He begins to bring comfort in the situations where there is no comfort. Amen. He begins to build you up when everybody else wants to tear you down. Amen. Glory to God. He begins to let you see past the formality of what your eyes want to see until the reality of the spirit realm where he wants you to come and be. Amen. He begins to expose some things inside of our lives. <coughs> Glory to God. 1 Timothy 4.1. Paul writes this to Timothy and says this. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrine of demons. Understand this, the Word of God is written for us to understand the time that we're living in right now to bring comfort to us that when we see it happen, we're not going back into fear. Because He didn't give us fear. Amen. He's giving us wisdom. He's giving us power. He's giving us love. He's giving us of a sound mind. So when we begin to see the things happen, we're not going back into fear, but we're rising up in boldness. We're rising up in faith. Why? Because He already told us beforehand, what was going to happen. Amen. He's bringing us comfort. 1 Corinthians 2.13, he tells us that he teaches us. Amen. 1 Corinthians 2.13, Paul writes and says this, These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with power. Spiritual things with spiritual things, which brings power. 
Ephesians 4.30, we know that the Holy Spirit can also be insulted. He can also be sorrowful. Amen. You know, uh, anytime we walk out of God's will, then all of a sudden we begin to do things that contradict the Word of God. We feel that grievance inside of us. What do you think that is? That's the Spirit of God being grieved. Amen. He can feel sorrow. When we do something that contradicts God's Word because we want to see a result, and we're not following after God's plan, it brings grief into the Spirit of God. Why? Because the Spirit of God is here to manifest what God's already told Jesus and for us to do. Amen. Let's go ahead and move on over here some. The Spirit of God can be resisted to and He can be lied to. One of the most favorite scriptures you hear in the Word of God is Acts 5, verses 1 through 11. And in Acts and Sapphire, they sold some property. They came back to, to give it to the, to the disciples' feet. And the question was asked, is this what you sold it for? And the first thing that the man said was, yes, it's what we sold it for. Then all of a sudden, the Bible said that he fell dead. The youth group came in, picked the man up, took him outside and buried him. Then all of a sudden, the man's wife came in. They asked him to ask her the same thing. And she said, oh, yes, 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 it is. And they said, the men who just buried your husband are at the door and they're coming for you too. She fell dead. They took her up, took her outside and buried her. Now, I want to tell you something. If that happens in the church today, the church will be filled with people reverencing God. Yeah. Amen. Because we have this facade, we serve an ever-loving God, a graceful God. No matter what I do, He's not going to punish me or bring judgment into me. That's a false doctrine. Because there's going to be judgment that's going to take place. Amen. We just have the advocate continually standing before God and us now saying, Lord, please don't do this. Please don't do this. Waiting for us to call back to him. Amen. Then we come to the third one, which we're going to spend some time on today. Is who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. When you get there, say hallelujah, amen, glory to God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. In the account of the creation, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. God did not say, let me, make man, may, let me make a man. You go back and you think about this, you look at this, you study the scriptures. Creation required three distinct actors playing three distinct parts in creation. God was referring to himself as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at scripture that supports all this. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Go back to the New Testament now. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. And Paul writes and says this, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. When we begin to look at this verse, what do we witness? We witness the Father anointing Jesus with the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons working together for one common purpose, to bring glory to the kingdom of God. Amen? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17. This is Jesus' account of being baptized. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling upon him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. This was not Jesus doing a ventriloquist act and presenting his voice somewhere. This was God the Father speaking from heaven, letting the Holy Spirit come down upon him and says, This is my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. You see God the Father, you see God the Son, you see God the Spirit working together for one purpose, to bring glory to the kingdom of God. Amen? Glory to God. Let's, let's look at this. If we was to take water... And I was going to set this up today, and I just didn't have time. If we was going to take water, and I put a liquid form right here of water, then I took this side right here, and I put ice here. Then I had me this side over here with water in it, and I began to have steam come from this, this whatever this iron, whatever it was. I began to have this water that was frozen. Look at you. And this water in the natural state is being water, a liquid form. Each one of these, the molecular st strategy has not changed one bit whatsoever. It is still H2O, it is still H2O, it is still HCO. But if I asked you what it was, you would say, that is steam. You would say, this is ice. You would say, this is water. Amen. In reality, this is water, this is water, and that's water because the molecular structure has not changed. 
Amen. You know, you go back and you look at Scripture, begin to look at all these Scriptures we're going to talk about. You begin to say, Lord, why did you have to do it this way? And God began to speak to me and tell me it's called the power of unity so that not one identity can take glory in, in everything I'm going to call them to do. They have to work together in the kingdom of God. Amen. That's why in the book of Ephesians, he talks about, Lord, let us have a revelation of who he is, who Jesus is, who God is. And if we don't have to ever have that revelation, we'll look at him as just being the son of God. We'll look at him as just being a prophet. We won't see the whole picture of what he's doing. You know, the very first book of John says that what? That the word what? Came down and came what? Dwelt among us and what? And became flesh. Amen. So Jesus is the written word of God in the reality being manifested by the thoughts of God. And the Holy Spirit is manifesting to bring the reality of the written word of God in power now. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. The last three weeks, God said, I want you to try, try this and try that and try that and try that. I'm going to change my prayer just a tweak, just a little bit. And all of a sudden, I begin to pray, bam, manifestation. We've been looking for paperwork in my house for the last two weeks, three weeks. And, and, I, and I went to bed, I said, you know what, Lord? And, and so I, I prayed to him. I said, but now, Father, in the name of Jesus. See, when you say Father in the name of Jesus, you just opened up the door of heaven. You opened it up. That's the access. Then all of a sudden now, the Holy Spirit is here to remind us of what Jesus says to manifest the written word of God, which is Jesus Christ in the flesh, of what he said. Amen? And so last night we're sitting there, I said, Lord, I need this paperwork. Don't know where it's at. We've got to get this girl registered for kindergarten. We've got to have this paperwork, Lord. I mean, it was our adoption papers. It was everything. I took them out and did something with them. And I want to tell you something. My wife went to bed last night. We was together saying the same prayer. And I got up this morning, and I went into my office, and I sat there about 435. I said, Lord, I just want to give you honor this morning. I love you. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for what you're about to do. And as soon as I said, he says, turn around. I turned around, and right there on the top of this desk was all that paperwork. <laughs> I've looked on that desk several times. And on the top of this desk was that paperwork. Now, I don't know if God physically went and got it where I hid it and put it up there or it was there the whole time. I just couldn't see it. I just know one thing. When I said, Holy Spirit, I need you to manifest this, I turned around and it was there. That's what I'm telling you. Same thing with healings of the past three weeks. I'm going to tweak my prayers a little bit because God says they, they, didn't, they didn't get what they was asking because they began to ask and missed. I begin to go back. He said, I'm going to show you some things about the, whole, about, the, about, about the Holy Spirit that maybe it was hidden from you or you knew, but you got so comfortable with the Holy Spirit, you couldn't see it. Amen. So stay with me as we go. We're just laying foundations. We're just laying foundations. Amen. So we look at this H2O. We see it's in three different forms, solid, liquid, and gas, but the structure or the molecular structure doesn't change. Just the temperature changes. So how hot you want to get with the Holy Ghost? That's what, that's what it boils down to. How hot do you want to get to the Holy Ghost? How much? See, we keep saying, Lord, I want more of your spirit. I want more of your spirit. You can't get no more of his spirit than what you have right now as being saved. But what you can do is how much can I give to you? Because when I give myself to the Spirit of God, now my wants and my desires begin to change because now they become what the Spirit of God wants, not what Randy wants. Now, I don't know about you, but my daddy loves to bless his children. And when you're walking in divine connection with him and in right standing, oh, the blessings of heaven don't stop. They keep right on pouring. Hallelujah. Are you with me this morning? Glory to God. So he says this right here, that when you see, you see this throughout Scripture, when you see the Son, you see the Father. And you see the Spirit was sent to reveal the Son to us. Because up until now, John 
walked with Jesus. It was his cousin. He didn't see him for who he was until the Spirit of God showed him who he was. Amen? John 17, 21 in the New Living Translation, Jesus makes this comment to his disciples. He says, I pray that they will all be one. Talking, he's talking to God, speaking this to the disciples. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. We don't serve three gods. We serve one God, and we're going to clarify this as we go through this thing. Amen? But the way that you view this will determine your access in heaven and will determine the power that God wants to reveal through you because the kingdom, have you ever heard, you ever wondered why it says, let your kingdom come, and all of a sudden you got all these people teaching on kingdom come. Have you ever seen that? You go and you go online. Well, what is God's kingdom? What's kingdom come? What's kingdom come? You ever seen that? Then all of a sudden, you've got Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. They're talking about you've got Beelzebub living inside of you. And he asked the question that if I cast out the spirit of Beelzebub by the spirit of God, let it be known to you that the kingdom of God has come near you. So what's the kingdom of God? It's the manifestation of the spirit of God manifesting God's word in your reality. That's the kingdom of God coming near you. You go back and you look at the scripture. Every time he said that, the spirit of God was manifesting. The spirit of God was manifesting. So if we're saying, Lord, let your kingdom come, well, let the spirit of God begin to manifest. Invite the spirit of God in your situation. Honor him and see what he does. He begins to blow some things up. He begins to open up doors that you shut a long time ago in your negativity. Amen. He begins to do some things in the spirit realm that you doubt him. That all of a sudden now your reality begins to change because you begin to say, Lord, I'm going to try you now in this right here. Spirit of God, I ask you now to manifest now in healing. All of a sudden God begins to manifest. Spirit of God, manifest now in a job. Lord, you know I need a job. Lord, I'm a tither. I'm a giver. I do all this for the kingdom of God. Holy Spirit, I ask you now to manifest. All of a sudden, before you get it out of your word, God begins to manifest inside of your life. Amen. Why? Because you're inviting the Spirit of God to manifest the Word of God to remind us what Jesus already said and what He taught us, which He got from God the Father, which cannot be a lie, and it cannot return void. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 1, 17 through 18, Paul's writing, and he, and he writes and says, Asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. It's dangerous when someone goes to school, get all the education, and they think now they can't grow no more. It's dangerous. Because every single day of our lives, the Spirit of God is trying to give us wisdom and understanding of who Jesus Christ is, of who the Creator is. Amen? And what His role here is here upon this earth. Amen? It's one purpose. That's to glorify the kingdom of God. Are you with me this morning? Stay close. Stay close. Then Paul writes this in verse 18. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. We are his inheritances. And he calls us glorious. Look at your neighbor and say, did you know you was glorious? Come on. Let's go on. we got a lot more to cover this morning. Amen. But God is one in purpose. And yet he has three expressions or persons that he shows us. But yet they all perform unique functions. But there's only one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We had that account. Romans chapter 3, verse 30, in the New King James, Paul writes this, Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith. In James chapter 2, 19, Jesus' brother says this, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. Amen? There is only one God. Now go back to Genesis chapter 1 again. Verses 1 through 2. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
we look at that scripture in the beginning, God, that word God comes from a a Hebrew word that means Elohim, which means it's a plural form of God. Amen. It also is applied to the supreme God. So we have to go back and do research to find out who this was that he's talking about. But if you look at verse 2, something's interesting in verse 2. Verse 2 tells us this. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. We go back and you look at this, and this gives us the first count of the Godhead who is called out by name, the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God, you go back and you look at things, this, I, I'm, 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 I may blow your mind here. The Spirit of God, you go back and look at things, it's a manifestation of God's written words or what He spoke. You go back and you look in Scripture in the New Testament, Jesus Christ was the Word of God made flesh. Amen? So you go back and you look at me and tie these things together, you've got God the Father speaking the words into existence, but then you've got the Holy Spirit manifesting God's Word that He spoke. So you go back and you ask the question. We know that God created, we, we go back, we know Jesus is God. We know that God the Father is God. We know that the Holy Spirit is God. But who is here on the scene of the Godhead now about to do some things? It's the Spirit of God. You know, I debated about doing this on a Sunday morning, but the Lord said, yes, they need, they need to hear this. Because some lives are about to be changed. Amen. Let's look at this. Amen? So who is the Holy Spirit? He is the most amazing, wonderful, kind, tender, sensitive, mighty person upon the face of the earth. Let me ask you this question here. If we was to ask the question, who's living in your heart today, what would you say? Talk to me, somebody. Talk to me. If we say that Jesus is, that's a misconception because Jesus is standing at the right-hand side of the Father in heaven. He can't be in heaven as the man, the sacrifice, and be here as two. So the Holy Spirit is living inside of our lives as the Father and as the Son because Jesus says the Father is coming living inside of me. And he says, those who confess me and me and the Father are going to come make our home within sight of thee. But we see God the Father sitting on the throne. We see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. And what we have here upon the earth is what Jesus came and left us. said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit, which is what? The manifestation of God's power and God's glory inside of our lives. Why? Because God the Father did what he's supposed to do. Jesus was a sacrifice and did what he's supposed to do. And he returned the authority back to man. So we have living inside of us the Spirit of God which is a reflection of God the Father and God the Son listen that's the true oneness of Jesus is God the Father God the Son and God the Spirit working together with one purpose manifesting with one God with one reality amen are you still with me this morning now, please come back next week so I can finish this up for you. Amen. It's dangerous when you come into an environment and you hear some scripture and you don't come back. Amen. Uh, but I'll tell you right now, I'm sitting, at, I'm, I'm sitting at my desk on Wednesday and being blown away by the Spirit of God speaking to me about some things. Amen. Because we go back, and, and yeah, Jesus did create, you know, go back and you, and you look at Hebrews. Go back and, I mean, you look G, yeah, in Colossians. Jesus did create the universe. He was part, he, was the, he did do this. Because he was the words of God that God spoke as the Spirit of God manifested to create it. He did do it. He did. But he did it as a word. And the Spirit of God is Jehovah. One God. We don't serve three gods. And and, and the reason why you even see Jesus sitting at the right-hand throne of God, he wants you to see the written word that he spoke. The advocate. He loved us so much that he said, when you look upon me, this is who you're going to see. Me and Jesus. Why? Because he is what I spoke into an existence that saved your butt from going to hell. And sometimes we need to hear it straight up, right? Glory to God. Now let's look at this right here. Are you ready to move forward? Hallelujah. We go back and when we look at the scripture and we, we begin to see this thing, we begin looking to heaven. 
Nowhere will you ever see the Spirit of God standing at the right-hand side of the Father. You see the Father, and you see Jesus. You never see the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God is not there. The Spirit of God is on the earth. Yes. Amen. Amen. Jesus is in heaven. The Father's in heaven. But the Spirit of God, according to Scripture, is here upon the earth, living inside of us, making that relationship with us so tight that when things begin to happen in our universe, we read, oh, Psalms 45, 3. Oh, let me go back there. i got to read that. i got no idea what it says. Oh, yeah, Isaiah 45, 2 through 11. Oh, let me go back and read that. Oh, Zechariah 12, 1 through 3. Let me go back and read that. i got no idea what it says. The Spirit of God is showing us prophecy coming to pass. Amen? Glory to God. Look at, uh, let's look at, look at some more here. And even in the back of what I just set up is Acts chapter 1, 9 through 11. Remember when Jesus was taken up into heaven and the disciples kept looking up like this right here? Remember what the angel said? Why are you looking up there? He's not here. The same Jesus you see going, you're going to see again coming back because I'm coming back riding on glory. Bringing his host with him to reclaim his kingdom. Bringing it to the reality. Hallelujah. So Jesus has been in the position of glory for over 2,000 years. He's not here upon the earth. He's at the right-hand side of the Father, which is a representation of glory and authority. Amen? So we've got to understand that the Holy Spirit is referred to by the Spirit of God, the, the Father, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to go ahead and close this down. We've got too much we have to go over today. Philippians chapter 1, 19, Paul writes and says this, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Remember, Paul was in prison. Paul was in jail. Paul was a couple of months away from dying. And he makes this comment. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 20. Jesus begins to talk to disciples and tell them that when you stand before people, it's going to persecute you. Don't try to come out with what you're going to say. And he makes this comment. For it is not you who speak, but it's the Spirit of the Father who speaks in you. Amen? So the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of Jesus teaching us through the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's why it's so powerful. That's why you're always in an uproar. That's why you're always going through trials and tribulations because if the enemy knows he can shake you up, not, not let you see the conformatory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you'll never walk in divine power. You may have some hit and misses, but if you don't want to walk in power all the time, we've got to get it lined up and get it straight. Amen? Amen. Let's look at one more. One more. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5 through 7 again. We also see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit working together as one in this passage. It says, There are difference of ministries, but the same Lord. There are difference of diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. You got the Lord in the New Testament is always referred to Jesus Christ. You got God is referring to the Father. You got the Spirit is working, referring to the Holy Spirit. Now no, notice this right here in verse 6. The Father operates or initiates. The Son administrates with the Word, giving orders, verse 5. But then you got the Holy Spirit in verse 7 who always manifests. Yet all of them is working together with one purpose. Amen? One purpose. And so the Holy Spirit is the manif manifester of creation. We already lined that up. I want you to go out on the website and pull these notes down because... There's about 20 different things that talks about what God has called in the New Testament. And some of these, just for an example, he's called the Comforter, the Lord, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Counsel, talking about the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Knowledge, the Spirit of Might, the Spirit of Understanding, the Spirit, and it can go on and on and on. But what we want to see from this right here is this, is that Jesus Christ was totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit, totally. Let's stand to our feet. As I read this to you. John chapter 14, 10. Again, Jesus says this. Do you not believe that I am, the, I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. 
but the Father who dwells in me does these works. You go back and you look about Jesus, and he was completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit, completely. He was conceived by the Spirit of God. He was taught by the Spirit of God. He was empowered by the Spirit of God at the Jordan River. And he didn't do one miracle until he was baptized by the Spirit of God. Even in John 5, 19, Jesus explains this. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. And whatever the Father does, the Son also does in like the same manner. He tells us the same thing about the Spirit of God in John chapter 14, 15 through 18. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Now notice this right here. The very fact that he'll never leave you depends upon if we're going to keep his commandments. I want to tell you something. There's times in my life I have not kept the commandments of God. I made some serious mistakes. But there's times that I've kept the commandments of God. And when I went back and began to live those commandments again, God took those situations that I did and began to turn them around for His glory. Amen? Verse 17 says, He is the Holy Spirit who leads us to all truth. Dr. Ruth don't lead you to all truth. Phil don't lead you to all truth. Oprah don't lead us to all truth. What does it say? It says the Spirit of God leads us to all truth. And what's truth? It's this. It's the living Word of God. Amen? The world can't receive Him. The world wants to kill Him and deny Him. Amen? That's why when God gave me that message about being true to the Word of God in a multiculturalism society, a progressive society, is because the more you progress with society, the more your conscience begins to be seared. So all of a sudden now, hey, ain't no big deal. We're going to do this. But it says this in verse 17, that the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. But now notice this about this passage that Jesus prefaces his comments with something about the Holy Spirit. And that's with a reminder to recognize that Jesus is the supreme authority in his lordship. Amen? Why do you think that when he says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, why? Because Jesus is the supreme lordship over this earth we live in. I don't care who it is. I don't care where you live. I don't care who's president. I don't care who's king or queen. Jesus is supreme lordship over this. Amen? So he begins to preface this by saying, listen, he's going to remind you of everything that I've said, but I'm still Supreme Lord. He's just going to manifest what I'm saying. Amen? Holy Spirit leads us to all truth. See, the Holy Spirit is meant to be a lifelong companion of ours. Not just to manifest in power when we find ourselves in trouble or do something beyond our capability, but a companion. Now, the word helper in the Hebrew or in the Greek, it gives us this word parakletos. And it gives us a picture of someone coming alongside of us to provide coaching, direction, instruction, and counsel in our life's journey. And it's meant to be on a permanent situation on a permanent place inside of our lives or basis when Jesus told his disciples in John 14 16 and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper he may abide with you forever there is no end to his partnership there is no end of his partnership with the Holy Spirit and the believer he the Holy Spirit is only limited in the lives of the believer by the believer not by God by us so Jesus is the one of supreme authority. He is the will of God in action. The thoughts of God manifested and the legal authority given to those who call on His name, which is the written Word of God, manifest in the lives of the believers. So according to Scripture, the only way to be saved and given access to the heaven 
for an eternity, it's through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit manifests the written word of God, bringing to the reality of the kingdom of God now. Every time you look in the word of God, when he says the kingdom of God has came near you, go back and look at that. He just manifested something after he was baptized in the Jordan River. The kingdom of God has come near you. The man with the other hand here. The kingdom of God has come near you. The lepers were healed. The kingdom of God has come near you. The deaf speak and the blind see. Why? Because the kingdom of God was manifested in their reality and became the reality. Amen. Jesus Christ coming and dying upon the cross for us ensures us that the Holy Spirit will always, always be here and living with us. Recognizing Him and inviting Him in and welcoming Him into our lives gives us full access to the manifest written Word of God, which is the kingdom of God in the lives of the believers. So if you're here today and you don't know who Jesus Christ is, that's the only way that you're going to be have access into the heaven. That's the only way that you're going to be saved according to scriptures. And that's the only way that you can have the Holy Spirit come and live inside of you and never leave you as an orphan. Having Jesus Christ in your life as your Lord and your Savior gives you bona fide access to the legal authority that God has given you upon this earth. 